Hey everybody, welcome to episode 100 of the Ask Staff Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we're gonna be giving away some stuff and answering your questions. Okay, so episode 100, obviously we're gonna celebrate by giving away some stuff for you guys, uh, our fans and or customers. Uh, how do we apply for this giveaway? Uh, first thing you need to do is uh, have an account on our site. So just create an account if you don't already have one through your email, all that stuff. And then comment in the description below and we'll be selecting random winners. First prize is going to be a $300 store credit. Second prize is gonna be a $100 store credit. And then third is going to be a swag pack from us. So again, anybody in the US or Canada is gonna be eligible for this. So make sure you comment in the description below, as well as uh, have an account on our site to be eligible for that, because obviously we need to load that on there. If you don't have an account and you won, we're gonna move on to the next person because uh, you know we, you should have an account for us to load it on to the credit onto uh, when we have that launch. So with all that said, let's get into our questions. Andrew via Facebook wants to know, how much power is really lost in the drivetrain of a four motion car? Okay, so drivetrain loss on four motion vehicles. So just for context, every one of these questions uh, that we pulled was a question that was asked for in the Mark 7 Facebook group. Big group of people, uh, it's a, a large group of people who kind of follow us and part of our customer base and that type of stuff. So it, all these questions came from them. So keep in mind in context, most of these are gonna be related to Mark 7 or pretty much exclusively Mark 7. So when we talk about four motion, there's a couple different variations of all wheel drive in Volkswagen Audi models. Four motion and Quattro is essentially the same thing, but there are four motion Haldex cars and then there's four motion, uh, which would, would use a torsion differential, what you would see in a lot of other Audis that don't fit either MQB or, or the A body platform cars. So if you're not familiar with how Haldex works, I shot a video talking about that in it, uh, alone by itself, which I will link to here where you can check that out. That video kind of will be important in understanding what I'm talking about here. Um, let's get into drivetrain loss. So drivetrain loss is something that I actually reached out to uh, another industry expert who deals a lot more, more with dynamic cars that I thought could give me a little bit of insight as far as specifics about these cars. Um, he, uh, he falls under this category of a lot of industry people where they oftentimes get kind of worked up over the ideas of things like this uh, because drivetrain loss is perceived to be a static number as a percentage or something like that. And it is never a static number. Drivetrain loss actually changes, uh, not just in different vehicles, which that's one case, but also in different circumstances, especially uh, you know, as power increases and stuff like that, you'll, you'll see more drivetrain loss happen. So he actually showed me dynos of a, of a car that had a big horsepower car and it ranged from around 21% roughly drivetrain loss uh, in the, I think it was like five or 600 horsepower range. And then when it got into the seven, 700, 750 range, it had, I think almost a 30%, I think it was about 29% drivetrain loss. So that's gonna vary. That was a, uh, that was a full-time all wheel drive model. When we talk about four motion Haldex cars, it's even kind of more of a moving target because having a car that like a, a Mark 7 Golf R that's essentially front wheel drive most of the time and then kicks in all wheel drive as needed. And that's going to be a variable number at all times. It's gonna be kind of changing when it's engaging and disengaging the uh, rear differential. So that actually complicates the idea of drive frame loss a little further because if you don't have loss of traction or necessarily what the vehicle sees as a need for uh, for all wheel drive, it won't even engage. So then your car is essentially acting as a front wheel drive car, a little more complicated than that because you still do have a drive shaft that's spinning. Uh, so there is some loss that's gonna happen through that as well because it, it does obviously drag down on power just having that spinning a little bit. Um, the general rule of thumb that people like to use in all wheel drive cars is 20%. Uh, 20 to 30 is probably on a, a, an accurate rough idea. Uh, again, industry people get pretty upset by this is when they're very meticulous about stuff because saying 20% or saying 25% is not really an accurate representation of that. So, but hopefully that answers the question. I don't have specific numbers for Golf R, but I wanna to touch on this just because I think there's a lot of things that 
uh, pieces to it that might be able to shed some light on. Dan via Facebook says, best modifications for leased vehicles. Okay, so best mods for a leased car. So anybody who has a new car obviously is, regardless of whether it's new, uh, leased or owned, is going to have the concerns around warranty. Um, and a lot of people said things like piggybacks or dog bone mounts and, and things like that in reply to him. Uh, to me, any mod that you do to your vehicle has potential to void your warranty, regardless of what it is. There's no, there's no surefire way to not have any warranty concerns short of just not modifying your car at all. Um, now, again, some things have less risk than others, which is why we'll talk about piggybacks. Um, to me, anything that is reversible or fairly easily reversible, and that's gonna be very different depending on the person, are mods that you, you can do if you lease a car. Um, you know, even so something as, as simple as software, you can put Unitronic software on a car because you can flash it back to stock. That's perfectly fine if you have a leased car, if you choose to go down that road, you want to tune it. Now, doing piggybacks is easier to take in and out for sure, uh, no question. And then things like dog bone mounts, that's obviously gets you a little bit better traction, but anything even like an intake or a downpipe, those are pretty easy to install for, for most people. And again, some people that may not be up their alley. So for them, that may not be the choice. Suspension falls along the same lines too. I mean, suspensions, I think are actually way harder to install a suspension than it would be to install a downpipe or an intake for sure. Uh, so that one may be tougher, but you probably could turn in a leased car with springs on it and it wouldn't be too big of a deal. It really just depends on a scenario. They're not generally super meticulous when they're going over a lease turn in. They're checking for damage. They're checking for worn brakes. They're checking for worn tires. Um, you know, a car that's just destroyed and isn't going to be valuable. A lot of times they're not going to be checking through super meticulously. The least, the thing to know about lease turn ins is lease turn ins are actually generally, and, and at least this is as far as I know at this time, and uh, I believe this to be true still is they're not checked by technicians before they go back. They're actually checked by uh, the people who accept the lease turn-ins and the people at the dealership who are generally on the sales side will, will be involved with that. Uh, people who are in technicians, they're not jacking the cars up on lifts, they're checking tires, they're checking brakes, they're checking the body of the car, they're checking the interior to make sure that the car is still in, in good order and hasn't been destroyed. So, um, but with that said, obviously, uh, that's going to be something that it's hard to answer definitively, but I, again, for me, anything that's reversible fairly easily, depending on the person, would be the things that I would suggest as potential mods for a lease car. Joe via Facebook says, what's the safest and most reliable stage one tune for the Mark 7 GTI? All right, so this question, this is kind of a tough thing to answer definitively because there's a lot that goes into this and, and you to have any actual factual evidence to, for me to say, definitively xyz you have to have the same cars long-term test to determine what the effects are long term um, now with that said i think there are some things that we can talk about that anecdotally that that are relevant but won't have a definitive outcome um, i think to me and people are going to say we're biased for this but i actually believe this to be true Unitronics tunes on Mark 7s tend to be less aggressive than, than most of the other tuners out there. Um, they, they try to make sure they maintain all uh, fail safes in place, which is why sometimes you'll have, people will have issues uh, if their fuel quality is low around uh, limp mode situations. And so they could lift those limp mode situations and, and not have them happen, but they're put in place to protect the engine. So that's one piece. They don't, they don't run as high a boost as some of the other tuners out there. And so when you look at other tuners that are running, let's say five, eight, 10 pounds of boost more, probably not quite 10, eight is probably more realistic. Um, you know, I, I am not gonna say that eight pounds more of boost is gonna blow your turbo, but I, but I have to say that there's no way that not that running eight pounds of boost doesn't have a different effect on your turbo than running significantly less. So if you're talking about running 20 or 25% less boost, of course that's going to have less overall strain in the turbo long-term and can affect long-term uh, health of that turbo. How long? It's tough. It, maybe it would have lasted 90,000 miles and instead it lasts 80,000 miles. You know, I don't think anybody's going to have definitive answers to that, but that's just what my gut tells me. And that's what I, you know, I can comfortably say that and feel good that 
that that's the case uh, based on my opinion. Mark via Facebook says, does water methanol cause damage to the throttle body over time when spraying before the throttle body, like when using a pre-tap location in throttle pipes that CTS or USB offer? Also, are Canadians eligible to win said prizes? Mark, first of all, yes, Canadians are going to be eligible to win uh, all the prizes that we've talked about. And so make sure you are part, are, are part of the contest. Also, uh, in regards to meth, uh, so will methanol damage the throttle body long term? I don't really know the answer to that. My gut tells me based on stuff that I've seen and read over time, it probably does have some long term effects. Again, kind of like this last question with the tunes, it's really anecdotal, and I, but I think that anytime you have something spraying on a throttle body, a chemical that was not intended to be there over a long period of time, I think it does have potential to cause damage. I don't think it's short term though. I think it's probably in the long game and it also depends on how often you use your water mask, um, you know, how often it's engaging, you know, depending on where the settings you have it set in place. So do I think that's a possibility? Yes, because I've seen some like stained throttle bodies from water mask, uh, you know, because different colorations of some of the water masks have uh, stained the throttle bodies and stuff like that causing sensor damage. Do I think that's a possibility? Yes. Do I think it's a long-term problem? Probably only a really long-term problem, but that's just what my gut tells me. With that said, we're actually working on possibly, this isn't really a guarantee, but possibly putting out a uh, water mesh spacer that goes between the throttle body and the manifold. So look for that as a possibility. I don't know if that's going to come for sure, but it is something we're looking at uh, to do some testing on and see uh, how viable that is, which obviously would be a solution for this problem, uh, given that that's a concern of yours. Matthew via Facebook says, do you have a suggested maintenance schedule for a daily and occasional track car? All right, Matthew, I don't really think that there's necessarily much of a difference as far as a car that, you know, necessarily, let's say spirited driving and then occasional track days, let's say once or twice a year you do track days. To me, the maintenance schedule on that car is gonna look very much like what you have on a standard car or really anybody who's kind of a vigilant enthusiast would maintain their car. The one thing I'll say uh, is actually we've put out some maintenance schedules for Mark 7s, which I'll make sure we link to in the description for uh, Mark 7 Golf R's, GTI's, and uh, Golf 180's. We have those maintenance schedules published as per VW's recommendations, just so anybody who's looking for that information, again, description below. But what I would say is follow along with that, but. In addition, maybe on track days, you might want to change your oil, uh, you know, near before and after, just in case you beat the death out of it um, and got it maybe super hot for whatever reason, because Mark 7s do tend to have high oil temps. Uh, also, uh, the things that you would want to do, which would be kind of standard track day stuff, in my opinion, is make sure your brakes are good, make sure you're fluid. You know, again, we just did that video on uh, brake fluid uh, exchanges but when you're upgrading your brake fluid, when you're tra doing track days, a legitimate track day, if nothing else, first of all, in my opinion, you should have a, at least upgraded pads and fluid. Uh, and really, uh, in my opinion, you should have pads, fluid, and rotors upgraded on that stuff. That will make sure that the brakes are good enough to handle uh, a track day for real. Uh, that, to me, tires and brakes are probably, if you're gonna track day your car, should be the number one and number two modification. Uh, because they are going to be uh, make you faster, first of all, um, and also you will smoke your brakes if you track the unstock pads and rotors. Um, so that would be the kind of the things I would check, which was more, again, along the lines of track prep stuff than it is along just maintaining a, a car that you either track or have spirited driving or whatever else. You know, a lot of the guys have kind of a 5,000 mile oil change interval that's kind of standard in the enthusiast community, you know, even though VW's maintenance interval is 10. Uh, and then along the rest of the lines really just becomes things that you want to make sure you're looking out for. And again, that brake fluid is an important one. Pads and rotors, tires, those are kind of along the next line. The other maintenance stuff is not as important. You know, you don't need to change your cabin filter uh, twice as often because you track your car. Thank you so much for watching episode 100 of the Ask App Show. Again, thank you for everybody who's been with us for all these episodes. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it, found some interesting stuff along the way. And again, thank you for anybody who supports us through your purchases. 
uh, we appreciate it very much. It helps us continue to be able to put out the stuff we do for you guys. And again, anybody who is wants to be a part of that contest, make sure account our site. Comment in the description below. We'll be selecting random winners. And good luck.